In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Brothers and sisters, in today's Gospel we hear the story of the rich young man who comes to our Lord and asks him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Now right away I think we should see this rich young man as a deeply uh, sympathetic and attractive figure. I haven't known a lot of rich young men in my time, but those that I have generally were not found out in the countryside looking for religious teaching from philosophers and, and rabbis and teachers. And very often those who are rich and those who are young tend to enjoy the gifts that they have. And even this question that he asks, what shall I do to inherit eternal life, shows that this young man knows that though he is rich and though he is young, ultimately he will die and that his youth and his wealth will avail him nothing. Ultimately, his life will come to an end. So how does our Lord respond? Well, he begins to joke with him, it seems to me. He says to him, why do you call me good? Why do you call me a good man? Only God is good. This is a strange response because it can seem like our Lord is saying that he is not good, right? That he should not be called a good teacher, which of course we know is not true. Rather, I think when the young man calls him a good teacher, he is saying this as a kind of a, a pleasantry, a, a, a politeness, maybe a little bit of flattery. But he does not understand, of course, that our Lord Jesus Christ, as God himself, and as the Word of God, the reason of God, the wisdom of God, is not merely a good teacher. He is the teacher of goodness itself. He is the way in which we know what good is. He reveals good in creation. So that by calling him a good teacher, it's, it's accurate, but it's far less than what he actually is, which is, as I said, the logos of God, the very goodness itself made incarnate. But then he goes on to answer the young man's question more directly. And he says you have to keep the commandments. And then he lists them. Don't murder, don't commit adultery, love your neighbor as yourself. And the young man says, well, I've done all this. I have kept all these commandments from my youth. Now, how many of us, indeed, could say that so boldly to God that we have kept all the commandments, we need to hear something else. But I think that we have every reason to believe in this case that the young man is telling the truth. Indeed, that is what the fathers say, by and large, that this young man has indeed lived an exceedingly virtuous life. Our Lord is not shy to call out those who are hypocrites, to tell them of their sins. Think of the Samaritan woman, or, the, uh, or even just any of his interactions with the Pharisees. But he does not say to this young man, well, have you? You know, what about this? What about that? He doesn't accuse him of anything. He simply says, well, if you would be perfect then, if you would do more, if you would go beyond this moral life that you have led, go sell all that you have and come and follow me. Give up your wealth and live in this radical way. Well, the young man, of course, we are told, because he has great wealth, he goes away sad. He is unable to do this, or chooses not to, rather, do this, this difficult command that our Lord gives him. And then our Lord says a curious thing. He says that it is harder for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of heaven than for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle. This has been something that, has, that, that Christians for for thousands of years now have questioned and thought about because it is a strange, uh, it's a strange metaphor, it is a strange example. One possible explanation, indeed I think there are two, and they're certainly not mutually contradictory. One explanation is that our Lord is engaging in a bit of wordplay that has been lost by the translation because of course he did not speak in English nor even in the Greek in which the gospel was originally recorded, but he would have been teaching most likely in Aramaic. And in Aramaic, the word for thick rope and the word for camel are almost identical. So it could have been that he was playing on not, not even as difficult as a thick rope going through a needle, but even actually a camel. Right? Something even more difficult, difficult as to be absurd. Anselm of Canterbury also says that actually in Jerusalem there was a gate in the wall of Jerusalem that was called the Eye of the Needle. And that it was very, very small, intentionally designed to be small, and it was the only gate that was left open at night. And it was really meant for pedestrian traffic, but you could bring a camel through. But in order for a camel to pass through this gate, he would have to shed all of his goods. There was no way he would be able to pass through with anything on his back, and that they would have to bend him down, and he would have to inch through the gate. 
And Anselm uses this as an example that, you know, if we want to enter into the heavenly Jerusalem, we need to be shed of our earthly goods, and we need to enter bowed down in humility. Certainly, I think both of these are true. But the apostles, when they hear this, they say, well, is this, is it possible then? How can anyone be saved? And our Lord's response is not particularly encouraging. He says, well, it's impossible with men, but with God all things are possible. As if to say, you know, in the same way that it is possible for God to take a camel for the eye of a needle, so it's possible for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. It's theoretically possible, but it's something you're not very likely to see. So what can we say about this teaching? Is it indeed commanded for all of us? to give up all that we have, to give it to the poor, and to live in a kind of radical way. Well, it may be, we have to say. Famously, St. Anthony, when he went to church as a young man, he walked in and he heard this very same gospel that we heard today. And he did precisely what the Lord commanded. He went and sold all of his goods. And he went and became the father of monks. He lived in this, in this radical way. But we also know when we look at the Synexarium, when we look at the lives of the saints, uh, saints like St. Saint Constantine, St. Saint, uh, Theodosius, St. Justinian, the emperor saints, for example. These men were extraordinarily rich. They were, some, they were the, but in the richest men in the empire, some of the richest men that ever lived in human history. And yet, in spite of this, they were able to find salvation. So I think what we have to say, at the very least, from our Lord's teaching, is that wealth is a barrier. It is a difficulty that has to be overcome in finding salvation. And why is that? Because I think wealth provides us with a kind of false security. It lets us believe that we are not really dependent on God in any way, and that the things that we have, the things that have been given to us, are really not things that we are owe to God or owe to those around us, but they are ours. They are ours to do with as we please. Instead of understanding, rather, that we are stewards of our wealth, of all things that we have been given, our knowledge, our wisdom, our health, our, our hard work, all things, all these things have been given to us by God. And like in the parable of the talents, God will have them back. And he will ask us what we have done with them. So in the same way, with our wealth, we have to ask ourselves, you know, are we rich men or are we stewards of wealth? But I want to return now to an earlier part of the gospel, really what I think, what I think is one of the saddest points in all of the gospel, is when this rich young man goes away sadly. He goes away and does not fulfill this commandment of the Lord. And I would ask you, brothers and sisters, to think for a moment of what we, the church, what we, the people of God, have lost because this young man did not have the courage to embrace, to embark on the commandment that the Lord gave. Indeed, our Lord told him to come and follow him. He could have been a great apostle. He could have converted nations. He could have left important sacred writings behind that we could have read even today in church. We could have his face hanging on the wall with the faces of the apostles and we could know his name. But instead, because he was unable to give up his wealth, he has disappeared into history. His wealth and his youth and his body have turned to dust and he is gone, completely unknown apart from this one story in the Gospel. And I'll tell you, brothers and sisters, we ourselves, actually, we find ourselves in precisely the same situation. Because God calls us, ultimately, to offer everything to Him, not only our possessions, but more than our possessions, our time, our life, the very wholeness of our being, every aspect of ourselves, and to offer this up into God to enter into the life that the Gospel offers to us more radically this full life that is informed by the divine life, the divinity that God wants to give unto us, that wants to offer to us. But because we are afraid, because we have much, because we are lazy, whatever the reason is, we fail to enter fully into this life. And we fail then to fulfill this great destiny that Christ has offered to us. And if we are not careful, brothers and sisters, we will receive the same fate as this rich young man. We will disappear facelessly, namelessly, into the dust of history. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.